Today is a new day. Doesn't matter what you've done, the Lord can forgive you. God wants to change our hearts before he changes our circumstances. I believe that God is gonna bring peace in a broken world through you. Good morning, dear friends. Welcome to the Our Power and thanks for your support to us. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Today, the message of Pastor Bobby Schiller is, Don't throw away tomorrow. Pastor Bobby Schiller uses the story of Isa, who despised his birthright to teach us. We need to take seriously the dream or vision from God. Work hard for it, even though we need to pay the price, such as we have to go through many trainings, take up a lot of time and effort. Somehow, this will bring us to a better tomorrow. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Pastor Bobby Schiller advises, don't waste our time on the worthy things, nor to conform to the pattern of this world. Focus on our personal growth. Don't blame, don't envy. Get rid of our bitterness. But to love people, to have a brand new heart. Pray and ask God to give us what we want. One day, the door to our tomorrow will be open for us. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Our program is bilingual broadcast. Other than our original English, if your TV is equipped with NACAM facility, you can choose to watch our power in original English or Cantonese dubbing. is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Hello, church family. It feels so good to be with you. You know, the Bible says that whoever walks in love toward others fulfills, fulfills all the law. You are loved. It is so good to be back, and we're so grateful to be in the house worshiping with you and worshiping with you on television or online. We're so grateful to be here, and we are here to lift up the name of Jesus. So let's do that today. Father, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for all that you've given us, the seed, the soil, the sunshine. We thank you for our country. We thank you for our friends. We thank you for our schools. We thank you for our jobs. Lord, we are thankful, and we want to praise your name for that. And we ask today that we would grow and become the kinds of people you have called us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. 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 Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I.
In preparation for the message, Genesis 25, 24. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Amen. Come on, friends, clap your hands. Do you see what I see? Yeah.
Jose Rodriguez is the founder and CEO of Rescue a Generation Incorporated. His nonprofit aims to reach struggling students who, due to unfortunate circumstances, find themselves not doing as well in school or at home. Jose dealt with a number of challenges as a teen and has used his experiences and transformation to encourage and inspire youth all over the country. His new book, Rescue a Generation, Reaching the Least, the Last, and Lost, now looks at how we can help those who need direction and belonging. Please welcome Jose Rodriguez. Jose, hi, great to see you. Well, Jose, I love your ministry. You and I have been friends for a long time, and your wife, Erica, was a big, important part of our team here, worked here for a long time, and now you guys are doing your own thing, but exactly. we're so great to have you in the house. For those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about your ministry and your heart. Yeah, well, um, our ministry is called Rescue a Generation. We are currently working on 37 middle school and high school campuses with some of the most at-risk students on those campuses. It came about because I feel like I'm proof that God still rescues people. And so because God snatched me out of gangs and poverty and drugs, um, I just made a commitment at an early age that I'd do whatever it took to go after students who are in the similar circumstances. And now we get a chance to do that at a really large rate uh, with an incredible team around us. But really, uh, we want to be in the trenches with students who are struggling. Now, tell me a little bit about your story. Um, I was surprised to hear, I didn't know this, that you're, you were in gangs in Tulsa, Oklahoma, my old stomping grounds, not Los Angeles. No. So uh, originally born and raised in North Tulsa. My uh, dad was a drug dealer. He got sent to prison when I was in seventh grade and I made a choice that I was gonna join a gang, was arrested for stealing cars, just on a path to going nowhere. But an outreach ministry uh, started to come into the neighborhood to reach me, started going to church because they had girls and pizza. And so I was like, I'm there, right? <laughs> Two awesome exactly. things. Exactly, and so, uh, but I got, I got discipled in that outreach ministry into the faith. It's amazing how when you go through tough times, God can use people that seem like in the worst places, isn't it? Absolutely, I feel like the Apostle Paul makes it clear. Remember, not any of us were wise when God first called us. All of us were broken at some level. And, uh, but I love my story because wherever God brought me, I'm so thankful that he brought me out of it because now we can go back into those same environments, those same situations. I'm not afraid of it, right? Can hit it head on and hopefully help to uh, rescue a few students in the process. I wanted you to have, uh, have you here because your new book, Rescue a Generation, which is also the name of your ministry, is such a good book. It's a short book, easy to read. The older generation needs to bless the younger generation. The older need, generation needs to learn because it's an education, right? It's, yeah. a, it's a, something you could read about. We need to learn to reach the next generation. Yeah. So often, especially gang members, we forget these are kids most of the time. Absolutely. They're dangerous kids, but yeah. they're still kids. Um, what is something I'm seeing sort of in my heart and mind's eye a grandmother who has a son that's maybe not in a gang or maybe is, but just is lost in some yeah. way or a mother who, you know, or a father who has a son, a daughter or something yeah. that's lost. What is a, something, a, a different way people can start to think? Yeah, I, I love, great question. I love that, you know, it's not ministries or programs or organizations that change lives, it's people. Mm. And it's the presence of a person in the life of a young person that 10 times out of a 10 will be the force that causes them to turn their way. And so the more present we can be, the better we'll be for this generation. And so that means asking questions, learning from them, right? Asking them how they're feeling and processing. And I talk a lot about gangs, but also, I mean, we're looking at a generation that's drowning through anxiety and depression mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, just social and emotional issues that they're struggling with. And so all of those issues are a system of brokenness. And so the more present we can be in the life of a student, the better off their chances to have a turnaround into a better life. There was something you say in the book and you had said earlier to me about earning the right or something like that, earning the ability to speak into someone's life, not just assuming you can do it. I think decades ago, especially in the church world, right, we assume that people would listen because we're leaders and pastors and ministry yeah. leaders. This generation is not like that. We now have to earn the right to speak into their life in a very real way. And you earn the right through relationships. Mm -hmm. Students don't care what you know until they know that you care. Yeah. And the more that you care, the more you show them that you care, the more you show up for them, the more they're gonna be open 
open to correction, to your authority in their life. And I often and say okay. authority without love is abuse. And so oftentimes we have a, try to have authority, but we don't have the love relationship with students. If you build the relationship first, the authority piece will come and they'll be so much more open to listening to what you have to say. Rescue a generation. Wow, what a good title for a book by Jose Rodriguez. Jose, thank you so much for your ministry. Thank you for helping us reach our kids. And thank you for being an example of what the gospel can do in someone's life. Appreciate you. Thanks, Bobby. Appreciate so you. God bless Absolutely. you, my friend. Thank you. I love you.
Let's say this together. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with my neighbor. Thanks. You can be seated. First thing I want to do is give everyone an opportunity to follow Jesus. It's the most important thing I say in any message. If you hear everything, everything else I say and not this, I messed up. We all need to be at peace with God. We all need to be reconciled to him because of our sin, because of the, the ways we've messed up, because of the ways we've fallen astray. Some of us have backslidden. We only get in so many choices in your life to receive Christ into your heart. Jesus said, anybody who denies me, I will deny before my Father in heaven. But anybody who acknowledges me, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I don't want to encourage you today to be at peace with God. Christ laid his life down on the cross that we could be forgiven from our sins, healed of our sicknesses, renewed in, our, in life and culture and family, that heaven could be on earth right now. All that he's asking for you is to respond in faith and say, forgive me, Lord, enter my life, give me the Holy Spirit, forgive me, renew me. I want to encourage you to do that today. You only have so many chances to receive Christ. I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you today to not throw away your tomorrow. This is something my grandpa taught a lot. Here's something we want to talk about today. Don't throw away an amazing tomorrow for an average today. This is something that most people are doing today. Most people have before them an amazing tomorrow. They have before them an amazing dream, an amazing calling, an amazing book, an amazing business, an amazing ministry, an amazing family, an amazing life, but they throw it away for an average today. Don't throw away your amazing tomorrow for an average today. You were called to be above, at least above average. This is something we all believed when we were children. Until somebody beat it out of us, or something beat it out of us, or someone shamed us, or we fell behind, or we failed, or, or we didn't get back up when we ought to have. We believed when we were children that we were called to have an above average life, and we were right. We believed that we were called to have above average impact, an above average result above average joy, above average health, above average state of mind. These are all things that are made available to us in this life that we throw away for today instead of living for an amazing tomorrow. Don't do that. Don't throw away your amazing tomorrow for an average today. That brings us to our passage today from our lectionary that Hannah read this morning, one of my all-time favorite passages. If you have your Bibles, you can open with me. Otherwise, look to the screen. It's in Genesis chapter 25, verse 24. It says, when the time came for her, so this is Rebecca, so you know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is Rebecca, this is the her, to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. Can you imagine a baby looking that way? <laughs> I have my camera out. So they named him Esau. And after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Now, this name Jacob, by the way, means heel grabber, literally. But it's an it's a idiom in Hebrew for a liar, a trickster, a deceiver. This is Jacob. And technically, Esau, although he was only born minutes earlier, is the elder and has received the birthright, which is the lion's share of all the estate of the family, of all the responsibility to be head of the tribe, head of the family, make the decisions, be the judge. It's a big responsibility. And so Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up. And Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country. Think you know, you know, stud, but maybe not so smart, maybe arrogant. Think Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> well, Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Think gamer, you know, maybe a student, maybe a guy that's probably indoors a lot, you know, kind of pale maybe, or something like that. He had a taste, so, okay, uh, so Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau because Esau was a hunter. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So you've got a little favoritism going on. 
Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. This is also why he's called Edom. Jacob replied, First sell me your birthright. First sell me your birthright. Give me a break. The birthright. That means the lion's share of the inheritance, as I said, all the authority. You know, it was supposed to be Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, but it wasn't. It changes this day. Esau says, look, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? At this point, the audience would have gasped. <gasps> He's going to do that? He's going to sell his birthright? Here's something in the modern world with all of our luxuries and all of our safety and all of our food that we don't recognize anymore. They would have said, He's just really hungry. And here he is, a man who's not really dying, a man who's just giving into his flesh. He says, what good is a birthright to me? Jacob says, swear it to me. So he swears an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And here's a famous line. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate it, drank, got up and left. And so Esau despised his birthright. That's what the Bible says. Esau despised his birthright. Everybody knows that he wasn't dying. He was just really, really hungry. We've all been really, really hungry before. But he wasn't starving. He was just really, really hungry. Here's what it says, really. It, to say he despised his birthright is to say he despised his future. He despised his blessing. He despised his promise. He despised his vision. He despised all that he could have been, and not just for him, but his children, and not just for his children, but his grandchildren. He despised it all because he was hungry and wanted a bowl of soup. And as ridiculous as that sounds, this is something that all of us do all the time. You have a birthright, you know. You have a birthright. There's a goal that God has given you. There's a dream God's placed in your heart, but it comes with a price. There's a person you've been called to, you've called to become. There's a life that you've been called to live. You know in your heart, for many of you, you, you maybe aren't there yet. You want to be there. You have the dream in your heart. Imagine that I, I live this life and I do okay. And I do the right thing. I go to church. I'm a good civil man. I'm, you know, propriety. I follow the rules. I get to heaven. And God says, here's the life you could have lived. But, here's the, but this is the life you, you actually lived. Here's the life you could have lived. Here's who you could have been. Here's what you could have achieved. Here's who, could have, who you could have seen, the places you could have been, the things you could have accomplished, the difference you could have made on history. Not for 10 years, but hundreds of years, long after you're gone. Here's the impact you could have made, but you didn't. I don't want to hear that, do you? We'll already know in our heart. You already do know in your heart. Pour it on. Get serious. Claim the life you were called to have. Take it seriously. It's life and death. You've been given life? Live it. Grab it. Become it. Paul says to us, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. What is the pattern of this world? It's average. What is the pattern of this world? It's laziness. What is the pattern of this world? It's lack of faith. What is the pattern of this world? It's, it's revenge and pettiness. And don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Your life changes when you get a new mind. Your life changes when you think different thoughts. Your life changes when you understand that the way you think is a choice. Your life changes when you decide that your mind is something that can be trained if you give it a little bit of effort every day. I'm not asking for legalism. I'm not asking for you to beat yourself up. I'm saying this because I love you. The life you want comes when you become a bigger person. You want a bigger life? Become a bigger person. You can. You can. Here's something we should all say and all can understand today. Whatever I want, I need to become more to get it. That is the message today. 
Whatever I want, whatever I need, I need to become more to get it. And here's how you become more. You live a life with God. You, you commit your life to him and his word. Do we want to blame our toxic relatives? Don't blame your toxic relatives. Don't blame a system. Don't blame your country. Don't blame the sea. Don't blame the soil. Don't blame your spouse. Don't blame your kids. Don't blame your parents. Take a look in the mirror. There's only one thing you can control, and that is yourself. You say, I can't control yourself. Well, there are things you can do, my friend. Many of us, we don't understand the cost of the time we waste. If you're on that phone two or three hours a day on Instagram or on YouTube or whatever, and there's fine doing a little bit of that, but if you're doing it all day in all your free time, here's what that phone is costing you. It's costing you an amazing future. It's costing you $1,600 plus the hours wasted, plus the attention wasted, plus the time you didn't give to the people who needed you. Here's what it cost you. It cost you a novel that you were supposed to write. It cost you the dream that God gave you. It cost you the walk you didn't take, the gym you didn't go to, the call you didn't make or receive, the family you neglected. This is what these expensive things in our life cost us when we devote our lives to oblivion, to fast forwarding our lives, to skipping. Don't do it, my friend. There's so much made available to you today if you can get a hold of the dream God has for you and stop checking out. Check in. Get serious about your life. Here's the key to the life that you want. It's personal change. It's personal change here. I know all of us were dealt a hand. Everybody, every single person in this room was dealt a hand, right? Some of us got a better hand than others. We all understand that. Some of us came from better families. Some of us didn't have the same trials. Some of us were born healthier than others, or given this or that, or this kind of advantage. It is absolutely true. But most of the people in this room were given one of the best hands of all time. And you know what that is? Everybody matters to God. God loves everyone. We all believe that, right? Just raise your hand if you just believe everybody is important to God. Okay, I believe that too. Look, I'm not trying to judge you. I'm just simply trying to say that here's something we all do. We compare up, we don't compare down. We compare up, we don't, com we don't compare down. And that causes us to sometimes be full of bitterness, of envy, of blame. Let's get rid of all of those things. Those are not from God. Here's what we want in life. We want a new dream, that there is no limit to what we can accomplish in God's kingdom. It's all about training. It's all about training. And can I tell you something? If you believe in training yourself to become the kind of person you were called to be, your life will get better and you'll have a big advantage over everybody else. Anybody who's played sports, anybody who's been trained for a job knows that the training part stinks until you get good. Then the training gets kind of fun. So you got to get through that first few months of training. You got to get through that first difficult thing in your marriage, in your job, in your family, in your walk with God. You got to get through the, the part that kind of hurts, that kind of aches, that kind of makes you not want to keep going. It's all about the consistency. And if you keep training yourself, you will acquire the life God has called for you because you will become a bigger person. Two lumberjacks are in the woods. The old proverb, they're chopping together. And every day, these two guys, about the same size, about the same strength, paid the same amount. They're both chopping wood. He takes the ax, he puts it over his shoulder. He goes, disappears for an hour, comes back. At the end of the day, the guy who takes an hour break has 50% more wood than the other guy. Finally, he gets so fed up, he looks at the guy that leaves every day. He says, you leave for an hour every single day. You go and take a break. And yet at the end of the day, you have 50% more wood than I do. How is that possible? And he says, well, for an hour every day, I leave, I go, and I sharpen my ax. That's why. That's why. It's not just about working hard. It's about training. It's not about trying harder. It's about taking that one hour at least every day to train your mind, to train your body, to train your life, to learn the things, to read the books, to listen to the podcast, to do what it takes to become all you're called to be. Think of your life as a magnet. Think of your life as a magnet that pulls things to it based on who you're becoming. Here's the wrong question to ask if you're single and you want to get married. 
How do I get married? How do I find the woman of my dreams or the man of my dreams? That's the wrong question. Here's the right question. How do I become the kind of person everybody wants to marry? That's a good question. That will get you hitched. Here's the wrong question. How do I get a dream job? How do I get that dream job I've always wanted? That's the wrong question. Here's the right question. How do I become the dream employee? How do I become the kind of person that I have multiple employers from multiple dream jobs knocking on my door? How do I become that person? The answer is sharpen your ax. How do I get a world-changing ministry? That's the wrong question. Don't ask, how do I get a world-changing ministry? Here's the right question. How do I become a world-changing person? Easy. That's it. Jesus is all about 12 disciples. 12. If I can get 12 guys to change their lives, I can change the world. We all love big churches. But God cares way more about big Christians than he does about big churches. That's what the Lord needs today is big Christians. He just needs 12. That's all he needs. He said 12 big Christians. Sharpen your ax. Become like the 12. Give it all you got. Take a hard look in the mirror. Don't blame your toxic relatives anymore. Don't blame your country. Don't blame this or that or anyone else. Look in the mirror. That's where the work can be done. That's where the change can happen. That's where the difference can be made. That's where you can become and have and do all that you were called to do. That's where it happens. Jesus says in Luke, the kingdom of God is within you. It's within you. Here's a goal I write every single day that's like this. I write down my goals every day. Believe that like a captain, I should know where my ship is going. You ask any captain of a ship, what's your port of call? They will tell you without even thinking about it where they're going. We should all have this kind of a, a way of thinking about our lives. We can change our port of call. We can change our direction. We should know. So I write it every day. Here's the first, one, first thing I write. I want to become the world's greatest husband and father. That's the first thing I write. Now notice the key word here is I want to become. I understand every single day that I am not the world's greatest father and husband yet, though I'm getting there. I got a card once that said that from my daughter, <laughs> world's greatest father. First we say is, here's how I have a great marriage, I become a great husband. Here's how I have a great family, I become a great dad. Better tomorrow than I was today. And your life, your marriage, everything gets better. When you fix things into one little area, they get better in every, every other area too. The better your family gets, it'll have a positive impact on your job, on your church, and even on your country. So you want to, you have a dream, you have a future, you have a thing you feel like God's called you to. Here's the number one skill you can develop in your life according to the scripture. Here's the number one thing you can do to completely turn your life around. Here's the number one thing you can do to open your life to answered prayers and to miracles and to abundance. Learn to love people. That's not the answer you thought I was going to give, is it? Jesus tells us in John chapter 15, if you abide in me and if you obey my commands, ask the Father anything you want and he'll give it to you. And here's my command, love one another the way I've loved you. Did you catch that? Listen to what he says. If you obey what I tell you right now, ask the Father for anything and he'll give it to you. Here's what I'm telling you to do, love one another. That's not, just, that's not it. The way I loved you. You say, oh, I love people. Well, do you love people the way Jesus loves you? Let me ask you, do you love your boss the way Jesus loves you? Do you love your colleagues the way Jesus loves you? Do you love your spouse? Do you love your enemies the way Jesus loves you? Do you love your political competitors and rivals the way Jesus loves you? Do you love annoying people the way Jesus loves you? Look, my friend, it's a skill. We don't love people by trying harder. Love happens by having a brand new heart. And a brand new heart happens through the baptism of the Spirit. A brand new heart comes from training. A brand new heart comes from being a disciple. So to love people is a skill. It's something you can study. Literally, it's something you can Google. It's something you can improve at. 
Can I just tell you that this is true in every aspect of life? A leader who loves their team can ask their team anything and they'll do it for them. Isn't that the truth? It's true in the military, isn't it? A company who, asks their, who loves their customers and asks them to leave a, you know, a thing on Yelp or whatever, their customers will do it. Citizens who love their countries, teachers who love their students, teachers who love their students can ask most of their students most, and they'll do it. When we learn to love people, we open up our world to abundance. It's just how it is. Here's something you can do every single day that will get you one step closer to the above average life, the amazing life God's called you to. Jesus gives us a formula. Here's something you do every day. Just so say this to yourself. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. If you memorize that passage, your life will change. If you just do what it says. Number one, ask. Ask. You have not because you ask not. Haven wanted this gift from, I can't say out loud what it is, but from a colleague of mine that was worth thousands of dollars. And she went and she said, Pastor, the Bible says, you have not because you ask not. I'm asking you for this. And he gave it to her. Why? Because she had chutzpah. They say in uh, Yiddish. She had the gall to ask. Have you asked? Have you asked your husband? Have you asked your wife? Have you asked your boss? Have you asked your neighbor? And most importantly, have you asked God? Amazing how often we want something or need something in life, but we never pray about it. We never just say it out loud and say, God, I want this thing. God, I need this thing. Here's what prayer does. Prayer forces you to say your goals and say your worries out loud. Here's what prayer does. It confirms to God that at least just a little part of you still believes in him. If you're not asking God, you probably don't really believe that much that he's really going to make a difference in your life. Ask him. But don't just ask. Ask and then what? Ask and you shall receive and then? <laughs> ask and you'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Here's a question for you. How much time do you commit every day looking for opportunity? How much time? So you've asked God for something, go look for it. You've asked God for something, go searching for it. Go find the signs, go find the knowledge, go find the data, go find the person, go find the door. Go find what you're looking for. Spend a little time every day looking for what you prayed for. Most of us, we, if we pray, we stop seeking. We're just like, okay, God's unfaithful. I ask, but nothing happened. You got to ask. Ask will be given to you. Seek and you will. Fine. Then what? Then what? Knock. Knock. Do something. Take action. You asked for a door. You went looking for a door. You discovered the door. And you walked away. You went looking for a door, you found a door, but you didn't. Knock. Knock. Knock on the door. Knock, knock, knock. You said, well, I knocked on the door, nobody answered. He says, you knock at three in the morning. If you go to the unjust judge, he'll give you what you want. Knock. If you knock on enough doors, eventually one will open, my friend. So this is what you do. Ask. I'm going to ask the Lord. Seek. Go looking for it. Knock. And the door will be open. Do not throw away your amazing tomorrow for an average today. So, Father, we thank you. We love you. We, we're grateful that you've gathered us together today. And all people are loved and treasured by you. All people have been given a vision. Most people will neglect it, but not us, Lord. Today we ask, today we seek, today we knock. In Jesus' name, amen.
the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for watching our power and your support to us. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Today, the message of Pastor Bobby Schiller is, Don't throw away tomorrow. Pastor Bobby Schiller uses the story of Isa, who despised his birthright to teach us. We need to take seriously the dream or vision from God. Work hard for it, even though we need to pay the price, such as we have to go through many trainings, take up a lot of time and effort. Somehow, this will bring us to a better tomorrow. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Pastor Bobby Schiller advises, don't waste our time on the worthy things, nor to conform to the pattern of this world. Focus on our personal growth. Don't blame, don't envy. Get rid of our bitterness. But to love people, to have a brand new heart. Pray and ask God to give us what we want. One day, the door to our tomorrow will be open for us. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Our Power This Motivational TV program is broadcast weekly on TVP Pearl Channel. Every Saturday at 10 a.m. in the morning and every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And you can also watch online simultaneously on My TV Super or www.hourofpower.org.hk. Thanks for joining. God loves you and see you next week on TVP Pearl. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. <laughs>